Hello, and welcome to I Am Dad podcast with your fatherhood authority, Kenneth Braswell. 30 minutes of wisdom, information, resources, and nuggets on your fatherhood journey. Or maybe you're just curious and want to hear some real talk about fatherhood, family, and the minds of men. Well, guess what? We got you too. Sit back, grab your pad and pen, and maybe even bring a little something to sip on. Enjoy 30 straight minutes of fatherhood, family, and fun with the fatherhood authority, Kenneth Braswell. Welcome to I Am Dad Podcast. I'm your host, Kenneth Braswell. Thank you once again for joining us for another episode of this podcast where we talk about all things fatherhood, all things manhood, all things parenting, all things relationship, all things wealth, all things calling, all things purpose. We talk about all things, but our focus is always on the perspective of fathers, um, whether we're talking about three-legged stools or stalled cars, you know, we're talking about the experience of dads. And so um, this year has just been a year of honor doing this because of the people that I've interviewed so far. I decided at the beginning of the year um, that what I wanted to do is I wanted to tell more stories and I wanted to hear more stories because I think people learn and glean more when they hear the stories of individuals um, to the extent of knowing not so much what, but they know why. And I think that's what stories do. Stories give us the perspective of why. And this brother that I have today, my good friend, Richard Barr, we've been around this space for a minute. And so, um, but every time I either have a personal conversation with him or I hear him talk about things, um, he is probably one of the most compelling brothers I've ever met uh, where you just want to hear him um, say more. And so I was like, I got to get him on the podcast this year so that we could just share um, who we are with the world so that when people begin to start thinking about this work of responsible fatherhood, not only do they know the work that we are trying to accomplish, but they know the spirits, emotions, bodies, and um, passion behind the work that we're trying to accomplish. How you doing, Mr. Barr? I'm doing well, sir. How you doing, Mr. Braswell? From New York to ATL, big apple to small apple. Let's go. <laughs> but we're taking a bite no matter where we're at. <laughs> we're taking a bite no matter what state we're in. And so, Richard, this is one of the things that we do when we start I Am Dad podcast because I think it sets the stage for the conversation and it gives people clear perspective of who we're talking about and then also where um, their motivation, calling, and purpose comes from. What's your daddy's story? Man, my daddy's story is um, beautiful, man. That's probably the best word I could give you. I, I'm probably one of the rare people, and I'm probably pro the term most people don't use, Kenny. I was probably overfathered. Um, <laughs> mm. uh, I mean, literally, um, I cannot remember a time when a man wasn't in my life. Wow. Um, as a matter of fact, my first name is Richard. My middle name is Benjamin. Richard is my grandfather's name, which was really the first name um, I really knew. First man I had a relationship. Benjamin is my father's first name. Um, and so uh, Richard Harris, who is my my mother's father. Um, I grew up in South Carolina, so um, when my when my parents were first when they first conceived me, my mama taught school, and my daddy was in the Navy. But because my mama was teaching school, she lived in Columbia. My grandparents lived in Camden. Um, I spent a whole lot of time with my with my granddaddy, particularly while my daddy was you know in the Navy uh, until he came back to Benedict College. Uh, my parents met at Benedict, and um, and and so Benjamin is my father's name. Um, and his father's name was Joseph Virgil Barr. Uh, so Richard Harris, uh, my granddaddy, Joseph Virgil, and my father, Benjamin James, people know him affectionately in South Carolina as B.J. Barr. Um, they were always in my life. I was probably the guy trying to duck his father. Um, <laughs> y'all everywhere. Like, <laughs> y'all everywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. at which, which actually... And I will tell you something, you know, probably from the outset. One thing fatherhood gave me is a deeper appreciation for it. Mm. Um, you know, when you grow up with something, people don't realize you can take something for granted. Um, I didn't really even appreciate uh, specifically my my father himself until I started in fatherhood in my early 20s. And I was helping a man look for his daddy. And I said to myself, while we were going through some apartments in Columbia, South Carolina, I've never a day in my life 
had to look for my dad. As a matter of fact, I was trying to avoid him. I was, <laughs> and, and I had to come home that night, 26, 27 years old, and apologize to my daddy for not appreciating him the way I should have and wanting him to be what I wanted him to be instead of giving me what I needed. Um, so fatherhood gave me a deeper appreciation for the men in my life. You know, it's interesting <laughs> because you. when I was um, uh, interviewed James Worthy a few weeks ago and we were talking about a time where him and I was out somewhere doing our fatherhood thing and it was the afterwards, right? I was, we were talking about how much we appreciate the afterwards of whenever we go and do our work that that mm -hmm. afterwards is always so rich because that's when we get to, as brothers get to know each other. And James one time said to me, uh, man, I don't have a story like you guys have. And I was like, well, what were you talking about? He's like, you guys have these stories about like not, you know, having your father in your life and they're so compelling. And I'm like, dude, your story has equal relevance. Like tell your story because what I need to understand as a child who um, had an absent dad in his life is I need to know why that pain is so, um, is so sharp in my life is so sharp in my life because I don't understand what I'm really missing is the father fullness. Yeah. And you have to tell that story so that I know why I'm hurting so bad because I'm hearing you say what you just said. Like when you do this work and talk about that aspect of your life, that father fullness, like what should people know about that, particularly people who are suffering or dealing with some level of father absence, what should they know about the fullness? Well, 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 the beauty in it is, A, you know, sometimes even we have a tendency to take it for granted. Um, it kind of reminds me of the Boys and Men song, let's not wait till the water runs dry. Um, right. And so you can have all the water you need, but don't like the water. <laughs> um, right. because, because the child in us still wants what we want. Um, and to be honest with you, starting in fatherhood, can I felt like the oddball because I'm, you know, I'm probably a little bit like James. Like, uh, do I need to come up with how my daddy, baby, didn't come home one night? Let me see if I can think right. of something. You know, <laughs> you know, and, and, and so I, I felt like the oddball in, in there. But then I realized, um, and this is what led me to this conclusion. And I, and, and I hope you don't mind me going here. No, what go we're ahead. really dealing with in this fatherhood work in this fatherhood space, the crux of the matter is relational poverty. Like you can have all the things in the world. You've seen the Ray Lewis stuff. You can have all the stuff in the world and be emotionally, mentally, and relationally impoverished from within. You can have all the outward trimmings and at the root of it be in relational poverty. And, th and that's honestly, that's really, can I believe this with everything in me? That's what we're really out to solve is how to make people rich. You know, all, all the stuff we do around economics, that's, that, that's, 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 that's fine, dandy. Yes, we have to do that. But, but if you, you know, what profits a man to have money in his pocket but don't have nobody to share it to or don't have any inheritance to pass it down? We're dealing with relational poverty at the root of everything. And, man, if, if me and you can, you know, bite a piece of that apple, you know, I think we can say well done that, you know, I help a child deal with relational poverty. His father is in his life. You know, um, and, and not to pass that on that that you can at least say my family will be rich in relationships. Right. You know, the other thing, too, Richard, is we another nuance, right, is that when we think about father absence, we always think about it from an urban perspective, right, that it only happens in New York City and Baltimore and Detroit and Houston and L.A., but then when Richard comes around and he's like, I'm from South Carolina, we're like, hmm? Like, <laughs> talk about that aspect because we kind of in our minds think that people, brothers and people who live in the South don't deal with father absence, don't deal with real issues like we deal with in urban centers. Well, 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 well here's the, the urban and the rural are the opposite side of the same coin. And, 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 I'll, and I'll give it to you like this. So if you look at the United States military, where do they do their primary recruiting from? Inner city and rural places. They do their recruiting from the places they think people are impoverished or want to escape from. 
So I live in this borough, not much going on here. I'm going to join the military, you know, or I'm out here in the country. I don't want to be on no farm. <laughs> you know, I don't want to do that. So I'm going to the military. And, and, and so the, the thing is, most of the people that leave rural areas, like I'm in South Carolina, you know somebody, Kenny, right now, I guarantee you that you met somebody in New York from South Carolina. It's the same thing in Philadelphia. It's the same thing in New Jersey. I don't. I don't know why we go straight up ninety five. Like if you were, <laughs> if you were, right. if you were in, in Georgia, if you were in North Carolina, South Carolina, you were in, in Philadelphia, New Jersey, New York. It's the same thing when you get to Alabama, Mississippi side. They move from Memphis to Chicago to Detroit. Mm-hmm. You know, every everybody moving on up or, or trying to get the good times. Either way you look. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, 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 because they were trying to escape, watch this, the economic poverty and some of those fathers left their families who they were intending to bring with them. You know, some of them didn't come back or some of them came back or maybe they went to the, the Vietnam era or they went to, a, you know, a war and they never, they never got that back. Or maybe they went up north too late and fell into one of the epidemics like the crack epidemic and then you know or that plant shut down on them and now they're ashamed to go back home you know it's um my uncle tells a story about he moved up north um i think he moved to new jersey or something and every time he would come back home he would rent a cadillac um you know let people down south know he was doing well uh, but he didn't tell it. He was renting it to you by 80 years old. Everybody's like, he doing so well. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, it was a mirror of, of a picture of what he wanted people, uh, to see. But, um, that's literally rural and urban are really the opposite side of the same coin because that's where mm-hmm. people pluck from, you know, mm-hmm. you know, various, you don't see them going out to the suburbs to pluck. They pluck from rural America and inner city America. Right. Now, you also were involved in organization in South Carolina doing fatherhood work, right? And so from your perspective, you're also a pastor, and I want to tie these two things in, but I want to talk about the work that you did with South Carolina Fathers and Families first. Um, When you were doing that work, like what were the most um, premier difficulties that you were dealing with in trying to work with fathers in the South? Because you guys were across the state. Like, people kind of, again, we talking this urban rural thing, right? People thought y'all was just in Columbia. They thought you was just in Augusta. They they, like, like, no, we were not there. We were where, to your point, where dudes are trying to figure this thing out from the farm to the factory, right? So talk a little bit about doing the work in those areas. Well, I believe when we, the genesis of it, the smallest county we may have been working in may have been Marlboro County with maybe 32,000 people in Hope County um, to the largest metropolitan areas in South Carolina being Greenville, which is the largest county in South Carolina, a little over 500,000 people. Then you have the Columbia's and the Charleston. So um, this is what we have to remember when you're developing something statewide is that don't ever Xerox anything. Is that you have to that you have to have a context for the culture. Um, what works in Greenville is not going to work in Charleston. It's different languages. It's different industry. So, you know, Kenny, you've seen this. People give us a term, you know, evidence-based. Well, if you did this evidence in St. Louis and then <laughs> and then you want to copy it and hand it to us and say, hey, do this in Marlboro County where they got one high school, 32,000 residents, and my fatherhood office up there, I went to see Derek one day. Derek was like, let's go to lunch. I'm like, Derek, we just crossed the state line. Because Derek lived 20 minutes from North Carolina. We ate lunch in North Carolina, came back to South Carolina to do the fatherhood work. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and so I think one thing, the challenge of a statewide network is to be nimble enough to make sure that you're balanced in your approach, but to be solid enough to make sure the principles are engaging. In other words, so you, you got some principles that match. Yes, People need good relationships. Yes, people want to be better economically. Yes, people need healthier relationships. Yes, people want to be healthy. That, that, that's fine. But in Georgetown, you know, we learned this in writing curriculum. It's no need to show pictures of a guy in an office, you know, a guy, you know, just sitting at a computer because they hunting down here and they in manufacturing. 
So when we were testing the curriculum, guy was like, y'all got any pictures of somebody on an RV fishing or something like that? I'm like, hmm, mm. cause that's what we do down here. We near the water, this the coast. Um, so the, to cast a very large net requires, um, and, I, and I, I'll go ahead and link the pastor in it for you, to be wise as a serpent, as humble as a dove. Uh, so, so to have the wisdom to say, this needs this, this needs this, and this is the point of commonality. You know, the other element that is, you know, similar to a New York, right? So we always say that, you know, in my estimation, New York is South Carolina, right? The only thing that's urban about the state of New York is New York City. Yeah. Like everybody who tells you they're from New York ain't from New York City, <laughs> right? That the vast majority of the state of New York is looks like Georgia, South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, and North and South North Carolina and Virginia. That's what upstate New York looks like. Mm -hmm. And so the other dynamic that you have being here in the South is that cultural perspective. Like when we're talking about um, black fathers, white fathers, and other fathers um, in the spectrum, how did you deal with the nuances of having to do this work where you're talking about simply looking for a picture that depicts, you know, fathers on the farm as opposed to in the factory? Um, when you're looking at cultural differences, did you have to um, deal with much of that as well? Of course, um, because culture trumps everything. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, pe pe people don't realize, you know, you know, we use terms like black and white. Yeah, that's true. But if I'm a black guy and grew up in an all white neighborhood, I might have more in common you know, with white people than black people. Uh, and, and so to take the time to do it, um, even even this is where I got to give kudos to the Sister Charity Foundation, to take the time to do a statewide listening session, you know, to understand, you know, the beauty about the word, of un the beauty about the word understand itself, it means to go among, to go in between, um, because you, it's some things you can't understand until you walk in it. And, and to be, to be a disciple of the field instead of trying to be an expert of the work. Um, and, uh, and if you let the, if you let the field disciple you, you can become an expert, but if you present yourself as an expert and you hadn't let the field disciple you, you will come in speaking a foreign language and you think you're actually coming from a place of strength. You're actually coming from a place of weakness, you know, stuff that means stuff, things in South Carolina is like, do you know, uh, and I'll give you a, a, a little, this will probably make good sense. So in South Carolina, you got three area codes. That's it, Kenny. Uh, 864, 803, and 843. Well, they all make barbecue, but they all use different sauces. In the 864, the barbecue sauce is ketchup-based. In the Midlands, where I am today, the barbecue sauce is mustard-based. At the coast, where the best barbecue is, in my humble opinion, um, it's vinegar-based. And but everybody eats barbecue, but everybody got a different sauce. And that's the same approach. And you had to take when you were doing this, like, let's make the barbecue, but let's make sure we put, use the right sauce so people can enjoy the flavor and be rich, be enriched by what we're offering. Instead of just saying we got this barbecue, everybody eat out the same plate. Right. right. And so now let's kind of bring in the layer of being a pastor into this space and bringing faith into this space, because. Yes, some people can also think that, um, particularly in the South, that everybody in the South worships the same way, right? <laughs> As opposed to in the North, where there's a little more diversity because the population is a little more diverse. You get to see a lot of other religions that you might not see in scale mm -hmm. in the South. But when you're trying to do this work from a faith-based, from a faith-based perspective, um, what are the nuances that you bring into that space to help you do the work? I think it's fundamentally the same approach. In other words, you let faith, and when I when I say faith, I'm going to use the Hebrew definition, you know, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. You let faith drive not necessarily cultural religional norms. And so if we can agree that this thing that we're after is good, you know, the beautiful thing about fatherhood and, and Kenny, you'll appreciate this, um, is that father is the only time God shares his name. So, so, so when we become a father, God has just shared his name with us. 
So let's find something that we fundamentally agree on. And if we fundamentally agree on that, the fact that men are important and men are essential, let's just start there. And now, because if you disagree on those two, Kenny, me and you might well pack up. <laughs> we might well pack up. <laughs> but if we can agree on on the fundamentals, then we can build from there right there. We can if we can agree that a cake needs a plate, and let's build from there instead of trying to build on the minute point. Let's build on the greater point. Most do you want a better community? Yeah. You know, you know, you know, would you like to mobile? Would you like to see your family better off after you leave? Yeah. OK, we, 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 we've, we've got a baseline. So let's establish the baseline and we don't have to fight over, you know, did God create light on the first day or did he do water? OK, you know, that to me, it's pretty laid out. But if you want to disagree, <laughs> <laughs> but let's agree on that. He's a creator. Can we agree there? OK, we yeah. got that point. Uh, so so if we can start there. And so I think I think we look for the commonalities of life because all of our, all of us have them, red, yellow, black or white. No matter where you're from, we all we all have a commonality. Um, wow. You know, we would walk in the room and we would say everybody who has a father um, um if you have a father, not if he's there, you know, not if he was there, if you know that somewhere at one point in time you had a father, raise your hand. You know, normally that was 100 percent, Ken. Mm-hmm. And so so we, we, if we can start here and agree on a baseline, we can grow from there. Well, the individual that believes that they don't have a father, that's a case study for a whole nother conversation. <laughs> right. Particularly if it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Clear if it's true, uh, but it ain't never been true. In any case that I've seen come across, you know, come across whenever I've been doing this work, and you know, I still stand on, you know, 100% of all biological individuals on a planet face of this planet has a father, right? Yeah. Yep. The question isn't if he exists; the question is where he exists. But mm-hmm. we have to ask the question where he is so that we can get to the issues that is of impact as a result of his absence. But the thing that we can't do and we got to stop doing is telling our children that their fathers don't exist because that doesn't explain the hole in their heart. And that is what they're searching for. And so, you know, when you are working with these dads, particularly um, in the South Carolina area, just kind of hang there for a minute. uh, What has been the thing that has raised up to be the most the biggest need of these dads, because I think that that now I'm learning, I think that it moves from place to place to place. And it may even move from time to time to time, right? It may shift what is the need. I think that um, ultimately, or most of what we have done has been built on this need to deal with child support. But what I'm learning now that we're doing this direct service with these dads in Atlanta, the child support ain't even in the top five sometimes. There's other things. So what have you seen to be the biggest needs of the DAS that you've served? Honestly, and, and, and these might seem a little, you know, intangible, but trust and purpose. Um, man, I can't tell you how many men have come back to me and said, you know, stuff like, man, thank you for keeping your word. Thank you for keeping your word when I didn't keep mine. You know, um, and it's it, and and that's one thing I've learned, man. So many times in this work that if a man feels like he can trust you, and most of us are coming from trust deficits, you know, if your father wasn't there, and so what? Why I need to trust you, you know? And and I was I was the guy. A roll up on me. I'm most of my men were coming out of incarceration in my early days. You know who this dude like. like hey. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, who this, who this guy that went to college, you know, why he looked like that, you know, um, and, and, and so I had I had to exemplify trust. And once I could establish that, what they needed next was a reason beyond themselves. So whether or not that was finding an identity in who you are, maybe that was what's my purpose or. I actually won't simply, and Kenny, I know you've heard this a hundred times. I just want to be a better daddy than my father was to me. Mm-hmm. So if we could establish a baseline of trust, a baseline of purpose, man, that that was the springboard to our greatest growth, man. If, if, matter of fact, Kenny, me and you ever do this again, I, I I go get a couple of my guys and we'll sit around and I'm, I, and I'm 
you know, I, I was at a basketball game the other night, man, and ran into a guy who was out of high school, who was in jail when I met him, is now teaching at high school. You know, at the same high school where his son's in 11, 12th grade, he's 42 years old. Um, you know, and, and, and so that's, that's, that's the thing that, that, that he, he looks happier than I've ever seen him in his life. Yeah. And I, that's, I'm glad you went there. Cause I want you to, um, so stories, right. And so one of the things that I've been kind of like thinking about is that, you know, this work that we do has to be humanized, right. That it can't just be data points. It's got to be humanized. So when people think about um, fathers, they have to think about them in a way that they think about any other living being, right? That fathers aren't disposable, that I can not care about them, but I can still use them for whatever it is I need to use them for. And so I think stories allow people to make intimate connections with the conversation, um, unlike, you know, the other things that our donated money goes to more um, than men like seals and trees and, you know, the rainforest. The animal and the, <laughs> right, the animal shelter. It's like, oh, what, we can't get money to help a dad who's trying to take care of his family, but, yeah. you know, we're pouring all this money in over here. Like I often tell people that I have 10,000 stories in my head over the course of my career, and many of those stories stick with me. And they are all the stories that has made, have made me who I am. You think about the multitude of stories that have come across your path. What is one or two that got in your head, stays in your head, and is probably going to always be in your head? <laughs> Man, you're going to make me drill it down to one or two. Uh, you just pick one out of 10 or 15, because I got hundreds, but I say one or two, whichever one is first front of mine uh, 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 I got I got I got I got this one guy man I, I you know when he when he first got out, I met him when we started fatherhood we were doing bridge services so we would we would start a guy when he was on the inside and we would make the connection there we do a little bit of work on the inside and then when he got outside you know he joined the you know the fatherhood organization um, in his local community and what I would do um, I would ask those guys to hey you know, why don't you write, you know, whoever you're living with, whether it be your, your auntie, your, your mama, your daddy, your, your grandma, whoever it is, write them a letter, you know, tell them what you're doing and introduce me in the letter. Um, what they did not know is that um, when they would do that, because um, they had the information, I would actually go visit the home um, before they actually got out. Um, because there's something I knew, man, when you get out of jail, you... <laughs> you know, <laughs> I forgot everything I just learned. And so it is part of, because fatherhood needs two sides. It needs a driving force and a restraining force. And so I, I do realize that you just did a year or three years or whatever it was inside, you know, you got to be really, really focused to be like, you know what? It's my first day out going to see Mr. Ball. You got to be really focused uh, to do that. Right. And so one guy, um, he came home and, um, you know, his first thing he wanted to do was get his driver's license. And um, and his mama said, have you gone to see Mr. Bar? And um, he was like, he forgot he wrote the letter. He was like, how, how do you know? <laughs> mm. and, uh, she, he was like, she's like, I'm only going to take you to get your driver's license if you're going to see Mr. Bar. And so he got his driver's license and his mama called the office. She said is, you know, I can't call his name. It was blank, blank there. And I was like, uh, I'm <laughs> And he went home and she was sitting up for him. And she called me on the phone while he walked in the door and said, and, and he was like, hey, and, and, she, and she, was, she was holding the phone and, said, and she said, if she was talking to him, he didn't know she was talking to me. And, um, and he was like, hey, hey, Gerald, Gerald, how was, um, oh, I called his name. <laughs> how was, uh, oh, it was good. So, so what y'all do? And um, he said something, and then she, and then she said, "Hold on, say, Mister Ball, is that what you did?" Mm. And and it was, it 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 just stuck in my mind because then she made this was a driving force. The only way you can borrow the car ever again, if you keep your word and you go to group. I had no more problem out of him. He graduated near the top uh, because you know he was on one side, 
and I was only and his mama was on the other, and we both had his best interest at heart. So that was just one of those uh, stories I just I just never forget. She literally set him up and made that he wanted to drive. He was he was one of the, he was just one of those Kenny. You know those guys. They just they yeah. Just, <laughs> he, right. he wanted to drive. So he was like, if you gonna drive, you going down to the Urban League. You <laughs> that's where you gonna be. Right. You know, one of the things when you just said that reminds me of it's like this whole notion of incentivizing, right? And so people are always talking about in this space, like, how do we incentivize dads to come to the program? You know, we should give them gift cards and we should do all this stuff. And I'm of the mind that I'm not trying to incentivize someone who is supposed to be doing what they're supposed to be doing. I'll reward them, but I'm not going to incentivize them. Reward only comes after the deed is done. Yeah. Incentivizing happens before you even done anything. It's kind of like the way that we're um, awarding our children these um, participation trophies like we just that's what we're doing now we're going to give you a trophy just because you showed up that's that, that that ain't no motivation to you do ain't get in the game you ain't even get in the game <laughs> <laughs> first of all your uniform on backwards first of all let's talk let's let's start there that, and i digress but anyway um i was talking to one of my staff people the other day, actually it was yesterday, and we were talking about um, some of our classes that we're doing around legal stuff. I'm getting these dads their legitimation here in Georgia. And she was talking about the number of moms or the number of women that were there with the dads. <clears throat> and she described the women and she says, I don't know how I kind of feel because she said a lot of them was like kind of really pushy and bossy. They were kind of like, you need to do this and you need to do that. And they was making sure they got through the paperwork and, you know, this needs to happen and blah, blah, blah. And she's telling me the story, and I'm like, I said, I said, um, I ain't mad at that. <laughs> I said, because somebody should be motivating them if they can't motivate themselves. And if it's the person in their lives that cares about them to the extent that, hey, if I'm going to be with you, then you need to have your S in order with the children you've already. Because how can I trust you? to be a father to my children, if you don't show me that you can be a father to the children that you've already had. And I said, that's why I don't incentivize people, but people do need to be encouraged and inspired to do things like that. Like when you see these fathers today, particularly our younger fathers who are struggling with trying to figure out like when they should engage and when they shouldn't engage and why they engage, particularly when we're talking about these new Gen, these Gen Z dads, right? And the ones that are coming behind them, which is the alpha dads, which is a whole nother conversation, right? When you were doing your program, like what was the hook? What was it that you guys offered to these dads that made them want to be with you more than you needed for them to be with you just because you had to check a box? Well, um, that's that's multifaceted because it depends on where he is and his intended desire. And so, and for clarity's sake, I'll, I'll do it like this. So when we first started, my average man was somewhere between 18 to 30. We were probably averaging middle 20. Um, but because we did something unique with them, most of them had some form of parole thing or some form of school thing that he didn't finish something or it was pro office. So we did a partnership with a probation officer and a lot, you know, South Carolina is level. So if, if you're in real bad shape, you got to go, you know, every week, you know, if you medium, you go twice a month. If you low, you go once a month. So our deal was if you came to fatherhood, um, they would automatically lower your level. Mm hmm. And if you ask guys if they want to come see me or take a pee test, man, that's a layup. Um, <laughs> so, 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 but, but it's once again, uh, you know, PPP served as one of my, you know, driving forces, you know, drive, drive. And I think, you know, programmatically, you know, every, every programmatic piece has to understand who am I recruiting? Who am I talking to with my audience and what's important to them? Not necessarily what do I want to do with them? But what's important to them. And at that time, Kenny, I was still in my 20s. So we had a basketball team, we had a bowling league, and we took retreats. 
man, we took a retreat, honestly, Kenny, you know, I, I don't know if I should say this live, and we took a retreat outside of Columbia. It, it, you know, it was probably 35 miles outside of the city. I went the long way so they could feel like, oh, I, I, I made 30 minutes turn like an hour and a half. I drove like, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but, but but a lot of them had never taken a trip. We stayed in cabins. They fished on the weekend. It was a total atmospheric shift. And something, you know, and that simple to me, because I, I kind of always done it. It was like, man, I get to sleep in a cabin. They might be sleeping on a couch somewhere. They had their own room that weekend, you know, they, they got they got to go fishing, they got to go hiking, they had boats out there. And the next year, I didn't I didn't have to ask anybody to return. They returned and on, and we doubled down, we let them bring their kids the second year. And and we empowered them because what we did is we made it seem like it was a retreat that they were inviting their kids to. I was the background music. Like, no, that's the driver, that's the guy that's bringing the food, but no, daddy did this. And and, and you wanna talk about programmatic power, Programmatic power is when you give a man who feels powerless powerful. Right. So, so rather, even if we were doing something simple, going to the zoo, I didn't stand in front of the gate saying, you know, here's your ticket, here, here, John, me and your daddy. No, no, you, you, you make that man feel a sense of pride. Your father's taking you here. Right. You know, only thing y'all got to do, y'all got to show up at group Thursday so you can come pick up the tickets. You know, and, Absolutely. And, and and so so my thing is, if you want to be a better father, I'm going to incentivize the destination. I'm not going to incentivize the fact that you came four weeks. In other words, this is about, as you said in the opening, it's about responsible fatherhood. So if you can be responsible enough to show up right here, I'll I, I'll put myself to the background to make you see response able. That's the power in that word. Uh, are we building fathers? that are able to respond to the things they need to do so they can be responsible. And so we want to build organizations where we are building men's skills, we're building their internal fortitude to be response able, able to respond. And that's how you make responsible men. Yeah, and you know, it's crazy when you say that because when we did our daddy diaper drive, I remember when we got the call from Huggies, they wanted us to do um, uh, a, a drive and they wanted us to give diapers to moms and my response to it was like that's not what we do I mean there's a ton of different agencies that you can get to do that and it's like yeah but we think it's a nice thing for you know a dad is I say yeah it's kind of a nice thing but it's not a relevant thing um, and it's not relevant to our mission our mission is to build the capacity of fathers to be more readily available to the children that they're responsible to and the families that they love I said, I do have a way that we can do that. And they was like, how? I said, give us the diapers. We'll give them to our dads. And I will never forget this, Richard. The woman said, well, what's the difference? I said, the difference is if I give the diapers to the dad so that they can take them to the mothers of their children, they are now empowered. If I give it directly to them, she gets to say to herself, or say to him when he shows up, oh, I had to have another agency do what you should be doing, right? Amen. And so that's, a, that's the difference. That is the primary difference because what you want to do is you want to your point, you want to be able to give men capital to bring into the space so that they can feel worthy in their own space. And I don't think that people think about that in programming, that sometimes you can do programming that literally on one hand, while you're trying to empower, um, disempowers them, you know, in in another way. And I think that that's why it's so important for people to know your client. That's why we do this workshop call. We used to call it, what about that? Now I've since started to call it, let's talk about that. And part of it is that you can only do as much for someone, what you know about that someone. Right. And so if you don't know everything about that person, it's hard to serve that person. Right. And that is where the work has to come into this. This question I didn't ask you because it slipped because we got into this other conversation. And I want to know this about you, which is your inspiration and how you got into this work, because everybody usually how I ask the question is, how'd you get here? Did you just get dropped here? Did you get forced here? Did you walk here? Like, what was your journey into this specific work? Man, um, I, I actually personally love this story. Um, it, it was an accident. Um, <laughs> uh, so it was, it was, it was real unique. So, um, 
after I graduated from college, you know, my first, you know, undergrad, my first job, I was um, a counselor in an addiction treatment unit. Um, and all, you know, all young men, you know, between the ages of 17 and 25 who were struggling with addiction issues, either if they wouldn't, if they wouldn't using it, they were selling it either, either way out, you know, and in, in, inside of the South Carolina Department of Corrections. And I, and I did so well um, there, I got fired. Um, I, I learned a hard lesson um, in, in that year, because uh, that was that was 2000, uh, and that was in a 99, actually, um, that sometimes people do want mediocre work. Um, you just just do what you're supposed to do. Don't go above and beyond. Uh, I, won't, I, won't, I won't tell you the exact firing story. So I ended up being fired. Um, and you know, went to the high school. I was a basketball player. So I went to coach my old high school basketball team. Um, so I was coaching at one school, substituting at the other. Um, and then one day I saw a real small um, ad. It was like, you ever seen them ads, Kennedy, they so vague. You're like, I don't quite know what this is, but <laughs> <laughs> if you yeah. like to help people in a caring environment, you know, apply now. I was like, okay. <laughs> and that could mean a thousand different things, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I applied, man, and it was um, it was the Urban League, um, and they had just applied to the Sisters of Charity Foundation to be a pilot fatherhood organization, and um, and so um, I made it through the first round, made it through the second round, made it through the third round, and I remember there was a big fight between some of the people on in the interview panel because at that time. Man, I'm 26. I ain't got no kids. You know, I ain't married. And, you know, and the director wanted somebody who looked apart. Um, but the director also was not the chairman of the, the search committee. They were like, but he got what it takes. And so I ended up getting it. And to, I didn't know anything about it. Literally, I got hired. They were like, okay, we got you. And they walked in with a grant. And they were like, we just got this grant. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, you need to figure it out. They sat it on my desk. That was it. I was the only employee. Um, <laughs> uh, I was in a room. <laughs> and it was, like, was like, oh, by the way, we had the grant ever since last year and it ends in June. And I got, I started the first week in February. So I'm like, okay, y'all already behind. And just, and so literally, you know, it was reading it. And, um, and this is where I made my first programmatic blunder but it was a wonderful learning lesson. Um, I went and found the men. I had all these men, but I didn't have any any off ramps for them. And so I, I would tell somebody in my experience, uh, build the structure before you put in the systems. Uh, and, and so I, I was getting people and then I realized I didn't, I fundamentally had nothing for them to do. Um, and so at that time, you know, it was just me. Uh, I worked from February to I hired my first employee um, can it, can this budget gonna blow it? My, my budget for that year was $120,000. Can, can you imagine that father? Uh, and so, and, and, uh, and so all you doing is going on a retreat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and they were charging me rent for that one room inside the league. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and I, and I, obviously I, 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 I remember, I remember my salary, my salary was 23, five. So yeah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, and, uh, so, and I, and I, and I hired my first assistant. I actually talked to her, uh, ironically today, cause she's now the executive director. Uh, so this is of course, you know, 23 years ago. Um, and, um, and so I, I kind of ended up there and the reason why I appreciate it, um, because I was at the ground roots, I was at the baseline, you know, we learned it together, you know, um, you know, you know, Patrick and, and Pat were over at, at foundation, you know, that, you know, they were, they were the people we call if we didn't have no money. Uh, but you know, so, so I, I was in the streets, Patrick was in the suites and, um, <laughs> and we, uh, and we, and we worked together to figure this thing out, man. And, uh, and it, and it flourished, it, it, it really flourished. And, um, and, and then to come full circle, um, I needed to be over fathered to help the men who were under father, wow. um, because they helped me see the value in what I had. Um, because the bottom line is, it's very hard to give when you nothing has never been deposited. So, so I became the person who was making the deposits. Uh, so these men today can 
can give, and a lot of them are giving at a very high level. Mm -hmm. When you look at the work today, what's the work that we got to drill down? We got to get 10 toes deep in, Um, because there's a lot of places that we can be in, but what, to your estimation, is where we should really be digging into? Um, I think it's the development side, because, okay, you know, when we started, it was like, you know, it was kind of like the whosoever will who had a heart for it. And so now you, you've been in this a while, you know, you get people to show up your door and, you know, oh, I want to help people or oh, I want to do good. Um, but now, you know, we've been using this term for years, whether it's on the federal level, state level, you know, you know, the field, the field has the bill of barn. We just can't be, we just can't keep being the field. Everybody just run it all out in yeah. the field. They ain't got yeah. no fence yeah. around it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, I, I was telling the, you know, the, you know, the director of, of, of the state, or one of the commissioners of this departments, in other words, like, like if you really want the work to be rooted, you have to invest in the work before somebody shows up at your door. And I'm talking from a practitioner's perspective. In other words, okay, we know enough now, you know, me and you can tell in 30 to 90 days whether or not somebody going to work. Right. Like, like, like we know it, we can, we can, we can smell it. Um, and, and so I think level one is that we have to develop the mindset. We have to prepare and we have to kind of purpose this work where we're looking at it long term. It is no longer a field. That's, that's level one. Level two I think we have to get to the point where we value men in general and it becomes part of the larger conversation and it does not feel like, because I, I personally, one thing I'm tired of is like, like if you lift a father up, you putting a mother down. I mean, how, how, how is that? You know, in the simplest of even all the way down to biology, every seed man needs soil. Seed in soil produces fruit. So the bottom line is, even if you look at the words father and mother, they both end with he and her. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know that, 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 the, the first two letters are different, but they all end the same way. And I think if we can take, so we can be part of the us, we and our conversation and get out of the, you know, you, me and my conversation, then we're really talking about family. And so now... You get equality in federal funding, you get equality in state funding, you get equality in support. Everybody want to throw that word around, but sometimes the equality means there's an equality of need and the need matches the services. Not necessarily, oh, I can get walk in this office and I get hired and somebody else don't. So the bottom line is if a family consists of a father and a mother that produces a child, there should be some equality in that. You know, I've been in a lot of conversations lately where people talk about, oh, you know, childhood poverty. And can you know, I kind of sit there and scratch my head? Like, it's it's fine to put all this investment in in children. I get it. But you got to go to a house where you ain't got no authority. Right. Absolutely. So if you do all this stuff with the kid, he got all these services, and he got to go to his room, sit down, shut up, and still walk into an abusive situation. It actually makes more sense to put more money in the root than actually in the fruit. Right. And to me, that's to me. I'm Kenny. Maybe I'm still slightly naive. No, you, you. I mean, you like me. You're a literal person when it comes to language because language says something. And if you keep saying it over and over and over and over again, people begin to buy into it. And so when you say and you start talking about children who are who are in poverty, you forget that they're impoverished children because their parents are impoverished. And if you're not putting the work into their parents, you're, it's the same thing about, um, and I don't wanna cut you off, but I just wanna say this, because when I came to Atlanta, we was talking about this, child mobility, right? It's the, it's the term that they use in schools when a child moves, goes from school to school to school to school. I was like, do you think five-year-old Johnny is just getting up one morning? <laughs> <laughs> we have to go go today. <laughs> so if you don't stabilize the parent, he's always gonna be moving. So what are we talking about here? Yeah, it's like going outside to wash your car every day, but your car ain't got no engine. <laughs> but it's clean. Where you going? It ain't going nowhere. It's, it's clean though. Like, like like you need to invest in the internal part, in the internal part before you do the other pieces. And and to me, it's 
it's so simple. You know, it's kind of like you said earlier. I know, I know we like to invest into the things that, that, that are cute, but the bottom line is if you do what's hard, the harder things become easier. If you do what's easier, you're going to keep dealing with the harder things. Um, and, and I, I think if we, if we really, really invest at an equal level, um, we can solve a lot of some of the things we're dealing with, man, and, and, and stop feeling like we're doing picket lines and, you know, end up in a, you know, people actually act like $100 million in the federal budget is a lot of money. That ain't nothing. <laughs> that ain't nothing. It's Michael Jackson said in the song. I can't remember what he said. That ain't nothing. <laughs> that ain't nothing. Last thing I wanted to hit you with is to bring this into the conversation because I don't think we figured this out yet. And that is, how does faith become more involved in the programmatic side of this work, in the theoretical side of this work, and the implementing of this work from our faith houses? How do we get them more involved? Either it could be just a um, get in where you fit in, but where do they fit in? I think they fit in foundation. A beautiful question, by the way, um, because um, if, if you allow me to approach this somewhat theologically, um, you know, Adam shows up first. I, and so, and I think when you deal with the thing that everything is coming out of, I think you can solve some other things. So you can use the Adam psyche, the framework in everything. You've never seen somebody like, yeah, I'm going to build this house and we're going to start at the roof. You know, nobody, <laughs> nobody, nobody, because you can't, it, 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 it you, you, you fundamentally, you, you fundamentally can't. And so, and, and, and so that to realize that we can center the fact that if you're really going to deal with it from a faith perspective, you have to deal with it spiritually, you have to deal with it psychologically, and you have to deal with it emotionally. And so therefore, you know, a lot of them can actually open up from even a language standpoint. See, one thing people are somewhat, uh, I don't know if I should say afraid to say, somehow when the church gets feminized oftentimes is because we've set it up for a level of femininity. You know, even historically, we go back to the urban and rural question that you asked. Well, if the men are being, you know, at work or being in the military, or, you know, if you look at the wars in this country, by the way, World War One, World War Two, the reason why a lot of churches did end up looking like they ended up looking at because men are going out. You know, women had to go into factories. And then, and then they needed a place of reprieve. So a lot of churches historically became that. Right. And, and, and so you end up with a, with a man, you know, leading a lot of women and younger boys. Right. And so um, I hear a lot of conversation with people talking about the church this, but I think another thing that men have to take responsibility for is that sometimes we've left the church and oftentimes the church has to work with who's left. And speak to who's left. Exactly. Um, and so I hear a lot of this, oh, what, what the church needs to do. Um, and the bottom line is we all need, I want I want to be clear about this. We all need God at the center of our life. And if, and if God, you know, made Adam and then pulled everything out of him, like it's always easier sometimes for a woman to see herself in a man and, and then for a man to see himself in a woman. And case in point, the word woe man, the last three letters on it are M-A-N, man that has a woman. The word female, the last four letters are M-A-L-E, pulled out. Female, male that carries the fetus, woman, you know, woman with a womb. And so I think sometimes if we can even be better of seeing the uniqueness and the power and the quality of family at the core of the church model, because it's a God idea. Family's a God idea. And that's why most churches have 
families that have been there for a long, it's a, it's a God idea. And I think we have to get back to God's ideas and not our ideas. And I think the church will take care of itself. Uh, and, and we have to do that through the word of God, not necessarily through our words. And so when, 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 when the world got messed up, Kenny, you know this, I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know. Who God came looking for? The person where he knew he already yeah. was and he didn't even really have to ask. It was a rhetorical <laughs> question, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think that's the fatherhood question. Adams, where are you? Why? And, 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 and when the Adams get back in place, every, every, everything else begins to line up. You know, when my daddy used to come to that school when I was acting up, man, I, I melt. I could be jumping up 10 minutes before my daddy show up, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it, something happened. It's the, it's the, the power of the presence of a male. It's the voice. And where are we missing that? We're missing in schools. If, if schools could change over. If, 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 if the employment base at schools could get back to 25%, we'll see a total different in youth. Oh, absolutely. Totally. Absolutely. Man. Richard, thanks so much, bro. I appreciate you, man. It's so um, awesome to always um, talk to you and, and have our iron sharpens iron, right? Which is um, part of what keeps me sane in this work, you know, being that I have a accountability circle that I can touch every now and then and motivates and inspires me to keep it going, man. Because, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, this ain't hard work. This is heart work. And if your heart ain't in it, step away from the table. Yeah. Because you're going to hurt somebody. Every day, all day. Yes, sir. Yeah. And so I appreciate you, bro. I appreciate everything you are and everything that you bring into this space and everything that you take out into the world um, because the richer bars of this world are needed desperately by our families and communities. And I'll end here with God knows what he's doing. Yeah. He knows what he's doing. We just got to be open, available uh, for the instruction and committed to move whether or not we know why we're moving or not. If he says left, just go left. Go left. And the challenge is leading people in discipleship so that when you turn left, they don't ask why you turn turning left. They just turn left too. Mm -hmm. That's back to that trust. Right. Yeah. And then don't get to the new land and blame turn left on you. Like, <laughs> Why you bring us out here? <laughs> so to your point earlier, going all the way back is all biblical in a sense. If we go back to the word, we'll figure this thing out. Um, and we will learn very quickly that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. The wheel has already been invented. We just got to figure out how to make it go round and round. That's the old elementary uh, school song say the wheels of the bus go round and round right and so thank you so much brother I appreciate you and I appreciate all of my I am dad listeners um, you know how I like to leave you always be kind to others as you're kind to yourself or you might find yourself by yourself always shoot high for your goals because even if you miss you'll be amongst the stars and that's my good friend Art Mitchell used to always say to me it's nice to be important but you know what it's much more important to be nice until, yeah. until next Sunday Peace out. Thank you so much for taking the time to spend with us. You've been listening to I Am Dad podcast. We hope that you have been informed, encouraged you to think, or even inspired your heart for the love of dads. The conversation does not end here. Come back and join us next week. Same time, same place. Or you can continue the dialogue on our I Am Dad Facebook page. We also invite you to listen to past episodes, learn more about us, and keep up with special activities by visiting IamDadPodcast.com. That's IamDadPodcast.com. Until next time, I leave you with this reminder of manhood from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. When I was a child... I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Because of this reminder, I will always understand that I am dad, period.